wonderful to be coming to you this afternoon on this week webinar. I hope you are all well and managing to enjoy this time we have somehow. This is our third lecture in this series and we have an another fantastic webinar for you today. We are very lucky to have Dr. Paolo Manzo speaking for us today. 
I have to say a huge thank you to Dr. Manzo for helping us put together today's webinar. I know a lot of work goes into preparing this lecture before all of us get to enjoy them. So thank you, Paolo, for your contribution to this webinar today. We are also very lucky to be joined by Professor Jonathan Sandler, who will be chairing today's event. Again, I would like to thank Jonathan for all his support with building this webinar series. Before I hand you over to Jonathan, who will host today even, I must let you know that we have another webinars coming tomorrow and next week. We do hope you will enjoy us for more lecture. The all AO team are available to support you and are very much looking forward to seeing you all in person again soon. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the lecture today. Please let me hand over to our chair for today, Professor Jonathan Sandler. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent, for your very kind introduction. And maybe we could have Paolo's uh, uh, video on at the same time. That would be nice. Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Paolo to you all uh, this afternoon. Paolo, um, Paolo, in 2004, obtained his specialty in orthodontics from the University of Naples. And he obtained his PhD in orthodontics in 2007. And then from 2008 to 2016, he worked as adjunct assistant professor at the University of Naples, Federico II, where he currently works as a clinical instructor in the School of Orthodontics. He's also currently adjunct assistant professors at the University of Trieste, of Ferrara, and of Geneva. He's a member of the Italian Board of Orthodontics from 2007, and from the, of the European Board of Orthodontics from 2011. And he's also a European uh, board diplomat for the Lingual Orthodontic Boards from 2014. He's president of the Italian Academy of Orthodontics, and he's an international lecturer in great demand and lectures on very many subjects. And it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Paolo now to give us his presentation on interdisciplinary orthodontics. Paolo. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for this kind introduction. I would like to thank you so much to moderate, to accept this invitation to moderate this, uh, this, uh, this lecture, this webinar. And uh, uh, also I want to thank Laurent to settle the uh, organization, the management of the of the webinar we are going uh, to, I'm going to, to, to give. And uh, it's really an honor for me to have uh, a kind of uh, chairman like Professor Sandler. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the webinar. Uh, I prepared uh, something on the uh, interdisciplinary orthodontics. And uh, after I want to show you a kind of a TED's targeted approach. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, I hope everything about audio and video will go well. Okay. So please tell me only if uh, everything is clear, if you see the screen and the audio is okay. It's going well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, the subject of today will be interdisciplinary orthodontics. I like this picture because it's really expressing what we are living, what we lived and what we are living now. And we, we feel closer with this kind of education online, so this webinar, even if I'm, uh, I'm, I, I can't wait to, to see all my friends at the Congresses because uh, it's uh, uh, impossible to substitute that moment. As uh, Professor Sandler told in the introduction, I'm a visiting professor at the University of Trieste, Ferrara, and also Genoa. And uh, I was trained uh, at the University of Federico II, and uh, uh, I had a lot of experience there I was also as a uh, visiting uh, professor to train uh, postgraduate students. It has been an honor for me to do this, and I like to do this. And uh, in, in Naples also, I uh, have my postgraduate program. I follow it my postgraduate program and also my PhD. Um, I go on with the presentation. I want to show you some pictures of my land because I come from the south of Italy, so from, from Naples. And if anyone, when the global lockdown will be really finished, I hope anyone will have a, will have a chance to visit our country and uh, 
uh, for, uh, uh, if you have a chance also to visit the south of, of Italy, like Naples, uh, this is a very nice land that you can have uh, 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 a kind of tour uh, around the islands. Uh, uh, you can have a good pizza. Uh, you can visit castles, churches, a lot of things. We have a lot of traditions. This is uh, the group of colleague I shared, colleagues I shared uh, a lot of time together because it was my group from Federico II University. Um, growing, growing because it's a, it's a big group. And uh, from 2019, as I told you, I started the cooperation, collaboration with Trieste University and then, <coughs> sorry, with Ferrara University. And uh, you see here, you can see here many of my friends. Uh, so going on, and also I, I found this picture two years ago because together with Laurent, with, uh, with uh, uh, Jonathan and with Alison, and also with uh, our friend Guido Sampersman, we had a dinner before the conference we had together in Budapest. Now, what about interdisciplinary I'm sorry, treatment? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, just one second. I just forget to say that people who want to ask questions have to use the Q&R button at the back of the screen, and Jonathan will manage the question at the end of your presentation. Sorry. Oh, sure. So question and answer tool to use to, uh, to play some, some question, and we will have at the end of the webinar. Okay? Um, so with interdisciplinary treatment, we can manage a lot of things. We can manage something like combined treatment with the ortho and perio, ortho and prosthetic treatment. We can uh, allow, uh, we can move the teeth in a, in a different position of the bone, creating new bone metrics. We can treat also um, a combination of treatment of uh, ultra passive eruption. We can do extrusion, intrusion, preparation of the posterior area for implants, a lot of things. So it's a wide, very wide topic. Now, uh, I want to show you uh, some of these patients, not all, but I want to start with this, because this, for me, they are very representative of how can be different, how can change the kind of therapy based on the diagnosis of, of, of a kind of problem that seems to be the same, but is not the same. So I want to start with Daniela. And Daniela, uh, when she came to me, uh, she was uh, uh, 31, and uh, uh, I started visiting her, uh, but before I, I really captured the uh, gray, the big uh, and very, very visible gummy smile. And the gummy smile was associated with this deep bite. You can see here on the right side, uh, a picture of the, of the frontal intraoral situation. So, you can see there is a uh, dental midline discrepancy, a severe deep bite. You can see also there is a cross bite on the right side. And uh, if we go on, you can see, uh, so the, 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 when, when Daniela smiles, when she smiles, uh, really the gummy smile is really important. Now, uh, what, what happens typically in this kind of patient? In this kind of patient, you immediately you catch that you are facing a class two, division two, for the typical inclination of the upper incisor that is going lingually. So we have a very palatally inclined uh, upper incisor. This is typical of class two, division two situations. And uh, this kind of situation uh, is uh, strictly connected with a small, with a redu redu reduced endorsement of the soft tissues. So in this kind of patient, you can see a good quality of soft tissues, but a reduced support because most of the support of the upper incisor is provided, uh, of the upper lip, sorry, is provided by the upper central incisor, lateral incisor also. When the upper incisor is lingual inclined, um, much, most of the times we lose some of the, the patient loses some of this support. What about the class relationship? You can see on the right side, we have a class two. So the, the, there is a class two only on the right side, while we have a class one on the left side, and we have a cross bite on the right side. If we want to, uh, to make a definition, the agnostic definition of this uh, kind of malocclusion, two division, two subdivision on the right. So we have class two on the right, class one on the left. Now we have a small crowding at the upper and a very, very small crowding also at the lower. 
And this is the panoramic uh, X-ray and the lateral head film. On the lateral head film, you can see the typical inclination of the upper incisor. Usually, this kind of patients, they don't have a leaking support of the bone. So they have a good level of bone, a good level of the mandibular synthesis with the mount, with, uh, it's wide. We don't have a, a, the typical situation of class two division one or skeletal class two. But this is a situation with the biretrusion of the upper and lower incisor. So we need to expand upper and lower arch, expand also sagittally, I mean. Sorry. <clears throat> now, uh, I like to move from diagnosis to the treatment plan by, by, uh, by using through the problem list. And if we check the problem list here, we have the unilateral crossbite, and this is one of the problems we have. But we also have a deep bite, and this deep bite is not only dental problem, because this deep bite is strictly connected with the gummy smile. So the amount of gummy smile and the, the type, the kind of deep bite and the divergence of the patient can change a lot can affect a lot uh, the, uh, uh, the, the way we want and we can correct this deep bite and this gamma We will see this. So going on, we have a deep bite and gamma smile, and we have a class two division two subdivision, so subdivision on the right. And this class two division two typically is connected with the, a soft tissue reduced support. So it's also a static problem. It's not only dental or dentoskeletal problem. It's a static problem during the smile and also at rest position of the patient. So uh, this is also confirmed by the X-rays and by cephalometrics uh, because we have a lingual inclination of the lower incisor, lingual inclination of the upper incisor, okay? We have to correct this. Then we have also another problem that is uh, the class two subdivision. So this means we have class two on the right and we have to correct this. And this is connected with a small, a small amount of dental upper midline deviation on the left. And this is important also, not only for diagnosis, but also for the planning of the treatment. plan. And uh, also we have dental size discrepancy. And this is a very important point because we know that with orthodontics, we cannot change the size of a tooth, we cannot change the shape of the tooth, we can only change the position of the teeth, okay? So we have to remember that a dental size discrepancy uh, is something strictly connected with class two division two because it has been demonstrated on European uh, uh, Journal of Orthodontics uh, that 14% of these patients, they have a genesis or upper lateral incisor and quite close to the half, so 7.5% of these, they have pegged shaped upper laterals. So we have to be, to be very careful with this patient. We have to pay a lot of attention because most of these patients, they have lingually inclined upper incisor. And so we don't catch any space. And if we don't catch any space uh, among the teeth at the upper arch, it means that uh, one point is, if we have a, 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 a peg shape, a real peg shape, so we catch that that tooth is smaller than it should be. But if we have a situation like Daniela with a small lateral incisor, they are not very, very peg, uh, we can miss an, an important information regarding the, small, the dental uh, size discrepancy. So is it, for this reason, it's very, very important to measure to assess measurements in any patient, in any condition. We can use a, a digital caliper, we can use a, a manual caliper, but it, 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 we, we need to measure. We can measure on the cast, we can measure on the scanning, uh, whenever we want, but it's important to measure. 7.5% of these patients, they have a dental size problem. So when we talk about dental size problem, and when uh, dental size problem is a dental size inter arch discrepancy, 
It means we are talking about micro aesthetics. So we are not talking about uh, only orthodontics. And micro aesthetics, this kind of interarch proportion has been described uh, very, very well in a milestone of the literature, in a paper published in 1958 by Wayne Bolton uh, in Seattle, an angle orthodontist. Uh, Wayne Bolton told us that if we measure from canine to canine at the upper arch and canine to canine at the lower arch, the discrepancy between two, these two arches should be like 23%. So it means the anterior Bolton index tell us that uh, in order to have a good relationship between upper and lower arch, we should have that the lower arch is 23% smaller from measured distal sides from canine to canine than the upper. So it should be 77% of the upper. And when we measure, when we consider this kind of proportion from six to six, so the overall Bolton index, total Bolton index, this kind of proportion is going to be reduced. So this discrepancy naturally is going to be reduced because it's around nine, 10%. So we have to remember this. And if we measure Daniela and we place the sum of, man this is from the original paper from Wayne Bolton, and we know that the sum of mandibular six uh, related uh, with the sum of maxillary six, four cent, it means anterior ratio. Normally, the anterior ratio has to be 77%, okay? And if we measure Daniela, uh, this patient, we know that at the lower arch, we have 37.2. So we should weigh something like 48 uh, at the upper arch. 48 is the ideal value. Okay, but when we measure this, we don't have 48 and we have 43.6. 43.6, it means ideal width is 48. Actual width is 43.6. And the amount of discrepancy is more than four millimeters. 4.4 millimeters is the amount of discrepancy between ideal arch and actual width of the teeth. So, uh, is it important uh, to have this value? Is it 4.4 something uh, big, something uh, possible to manage only with orthodontics, uh, or is, impos is it impossible to manage only with orthodontic treatment? I want to, to, to tell you that this has been very well described on the Engel Orthodontist paper in 2000, published in 2009 from a Japanese group. They demonstrated us that any time we are outside two standard deviation of the bolt or two millimeters outside two millimeters of discrepancy, it means we are over the threshold for clinically significant tooth side discrepancy. So anytime it happens, we should speak with the patient or with the parents of the patient, telling them that we can't correct all by means only of orthodontic treatment. Some water, please. <clears throat> so the treatment plan should be based on the problem list. So what about unilateral crossbite? We started with unilateral crossbite. First of all, the, from the diagnostic point of view, how to manage this crossbite? If we have a crossbite like this, and we have an inverted Wilson curvature, it means that the Wilson curvature connecting the palatal cusp and buccal cusp of a molar on one side to the other, from one side to the other side, should be concave at the upper, okay? If it's concave at the lower, so it's down concave, uh, it means we have a dental um, compensation of the crossbite. So we can expand with dental expansion. If we have a, a normal Wilson curvature or we have a, a, a overcorrected Wilson curvature, it means we have to expand the bone. We can expand skeletally. We can, we can expand with the bone borne therapy, with the mean influence, with how, how, whatever you want. But 
the important thing is that the, 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 dif the differential diagnosis between this. And so in this patient with Daniela, we have an inverted Wilson curvature because the posterior teeth, they have an inclination uh, lingually. So we can expand by means of dental treatment and usually to expand molars, I use transpalatal arch. And with transpalatal arch, we can expand only one side, like right side. How to expand only one side with transpalatal arch? Transpalatal arch is a, a one single device. So if we expand like this, we expand at uh, left side and also at right side. We cannot split this force, but we can introduce uh, on one side uh, some root buccal torque. Root buccal torque, it expresses some extrusion on one side, the readout side, and intrusion on the uh, opposite side, and also some root negative torque. So if we compare the two sides, on the side we want to expand, we have only dental expansion. So what we need of the expansion of the crown. So this is uncontrolled tipping, buccally, okay? And on the other side, we are placing some body, bodily movement uh, that requires more anchorage. So on this side, on left side, we have a bodily anchorage of the molar, and on the right side, we have expansion of the, of, the, of the tooth. So we have unilateral expansion. We can promote unilateral expansion. Now, once uh, the cross bite is corrected, we have to correct something more. There is the deep bite and the gum is my horse because we can correct the deep bite. And uh, in the meanwhile, we can correct the gum is my but after we will check how it's possible to correct very efficiently gamma in a deep bite patient like Daniela. In this case, uh, we were using, I, I was asking Daniela to use a uh, class two elastics and we corrected the deep bite and also torque of the upper incisor by means of this wire that is called the TRUA. TRUA utility arch is a kind of arch wire published on Journal of Clinical Orthodontics in 1997 from two orthodontists. They were some of my mentors, Roberto Martina and uh, Paduano. And if you activate the TRUA from the anterior, from the anterior side, so you, you have a readout on the posterior, uh, you have intrusion uh, anteriorly, uh, sorry, intrusion posteriorly, extrusion anteriorly, and when you have a readout on the opposite side, you have intrusion on the anterior, extrusion to the posterior. But if we activate only like this, we can have intrusion and we can have also the expression of the torque. Okay? So with the TRUA, we corrected the gamma and then with class two elastics, we corrected class two division two subdivision on the right. So the class two on the right with the aesthetic that also affects the aesthetics of the patient. We know this has been corrected by means of high torque, so class two division two, the division two with the lingual inclination of the upper incisor has been corrected by means of high torque prescription because at that time I still was using Ricketts prescription. I was trained during my post-graduation with Ricketts technique and also now I have to correct also dental midline discrepancy. The discrepancy of the upper midline with the face, a small discrepancy on the left, and the discrepancy was corrected also with the elastics. And this is very, very in agreement with the diagnosis because we have a diagnosis of class two on the right, dental midline discrepancy on the left, at the upper, so we can correct with the class two elastics, continuous with a, a full time class two elastics on the right and half time class two elastics on the left. And as you can see, we have class one on the left, on the right, and we still are keeping the class one on the left. But now we have to face this problem. I told you, we cannot, uh, we cannot correct uh, the dental size discrepancy only, this kind of discrepancy, only by means of orthodontic treatment, but we need also one step more. The step can be restoration, direct restoration step or indirect restoration step. 
And I want to tell you, as the measure, as the difference between ideal width and actual width is like 4.4, it means we should manage the second step with a static phase. With this patient, what, what I've done, at that time, I didn't use a, a, um, a digital workflow, but I used an analogic, uh, I used the analogic workflow. And my uh, lab mounted the uh, raising teeth on a piece of wire passing through the crowns like this. And we can move the crowns on the first order, so horizontal plane. And once we decide that the position of the teeth is OK, we can add some raisin to the raising of the teeth, and we can transform in something like this. After, when we transform in something, something like this, we can take an impression and we can create a vacuum mold, a vacuum formed appliance that we will use at the end of orthodontic treatment to make something called mock-up, a trial in the mouth of the patient with raising or composite in order to make a trial. If the patient likes this, and if we like this, we can go on with prosthetic or restorative treatment. So at this phase, before to start, we have to have the end in the mind. And we have to start, we can also produce a, a kind of appliance to make a mock-up at the end of orthodontic phase. Then we remove the raisin or the composite from the teeth, and we have the final position of the teeth on the cast. And we can take an impression uh, we can, um, we can um, go on mounting the patient. Uh, I, I started the, the orthodontic treatment in this patient, and I want to show you how I managed in this patient the position of the teeth before the restoration. It's very important to manage uh, correctly the position of these teeth because uh, uh, sometimes this movement, they have to be very, very light like 0 0.2, 0 0.5, one millimeter, no more usually. And so I want to show you what happens if I want to move this lateral incisor one millimeter uh, 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 toward the, uh, the, the dental midline. So one millimeter in this direction, huh? on, the left, on the right side of the patient. And I can use an active spring, so an active core spring. But if what happens if the patient misses one, two, three appointments. It happens in my experience. And it can be very dangerous because the patient can be corrected with overcorrection, so more than we expect. So for this patient, I usually cut the, a passive coil spring, cut one millimeter far from the bracket. So I can move the, the, the lateral incisor and also the lateral incisor bracket only one millimeter, no more. And I can also use a, as active uh, unit also the power chain here. For example, I want to correct this midline half millimeter, moving on the right, the upper midline. So I can move with the power chain and I can stop half millimeter uh, a, a core spring back to the distal, to the, to the uh, bracket of the central incisor on the right. And so I use, for the passivization, I use a passive core spring. For the active units I use, uh, for the movement, I use a core spring and a power chain. Another way to stabilize the movement of a, la of a, of a, of a tooth, like this lateral incisor, <coughs> sorry, I want to move distally, and I don't want to move more than one millimeter. So I can place some flow composite and uh, the flow composite can stop the movement of the lateral incisor, uh, avoiding to move more than one millimeter distally, okay? When we, when we think we are ready to remove the appliance, before doing this, usually in my experience, I try to remove the wire. I check if we have any uh, uh, pre-contact, uh, any other movement, or everything is stable, so I feel comfortable to remove the appliance. Then class one on the right, class one on the left, the correction of deep bite, um, the management of the spaces agreed with my uh, specialist and with my prosthetist, because now I'm going to show you what we have done. And remember, 
Anytime you prepare a patient for the interdisciplinary second step, restoration or prosthetic step, uh, you have to stop the position of the teeth. Even if you need uh, a couple of days or three days, five days uh, to prepare a removable appliance like vacuum mold, vacuum formed to deliver to the patient, you should stop the patient with a retainer. Something very easy, like in this case, I placed a retainer between canine and canine, from canine to canine, and now I feel comfortable to remove the, the, the brackets and I can wait very comfortably the, the upper appliance if I want to, to use a removable appliance. Then this is the end of orthodontic phase. Do you think any kind of patient can be happy if we don't tell this patient that we should provide the second step with the a restorative step, prosthetic step, for sure, they, they don't know we corrected cross bite, we corrected the class two, we corrected deep bite. They only know that we, they finish it, they have some spaces on the anteriors they don't want. So we have to be very clear before to start the treatment that this will be followed, the orthodontic treatment will be followed by a kind of prosthetic treatment. So we go on and with the vacuum molded appliance we created at the beginning, before to start the treatment, we can do some raising mock-up. The raising mock-up is something like this. And if the patient say, yes, doctor, I like it, we can go on and we can provide with the, uh, uh, the, 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 with the not temporary, with a, a final restoration. The final restoration I agreed with my prosthetist, Giorgio. We decided with Giorgio De Simone, we decided to place with this patient to use something that is a addictionals. The addictionals is a piece, a very small piece of ceramics. We can add uh, distally or mesially to this teeth and we can, um, we can completely change the size and we can also change the shape of the teeth. With this addictional, uh, these are like veneers. They are a little bit more complicated to merge as color and as shadows uh, uh, to the rest of the tooth because it's not covering all the fascial aspect of the uh, incisor, but it's covering, is adding only some, something uh, distally or mesial, okay? And now very, very small preparation. So the preparation is very, very light. We don't need to make a lot of preparation like this. So it's a very conservative one. And uh, after we, uh, the, the prosthetic take very, takes a very, very sharp uh, impression, very precise impression. And you can see how much it changes when we have these additionals to the distal surface of this teeth. So measures, measure surface and distal surface, they were completely changed. And uh, also the relationship between the anterior is completely changed and the aesthetics a lot also. So class one is important. A correction of crossbite is important, but we need to provide an interdisciplinary treatment uh, with our colleagues uh, to discuss since the beginning to provide and to deliver a kind of treatment with a second step treatment. So this is the comparison. And this is what we would like to obtain, especially on the upper incisor from time zero to time one and time two after prosthetic treatment. So the full correction of uh, torque of the upper incisor. And what about the deep bite? If in a, why is it is important to put in agreement our diagnosis with treatment plan? Because uh, in a kind of deep bite like Daniela's one, and uh, with this kind of gummy smile, if we produce, if we correct the speed curvature or it may mean of intrusion of the lower incisor, we can miss an opportunity of correcting the gummy smile also. So this is not advisable. But if we correct this deep bite by means of, intru of the intrusion of the upper incisor, this is okay. And we can change, you can see a morph here, we can change completely the position of the upper incisor and also the position of the upper incisor in the face, because now Daniela, she changed completely, not only from orthodontic point of view, but also from the aesthetic point of view, and also from the social interrelationship point of view. 
Okay, so this is Daniela, okay, before and after. And now the situation is completely changed also from the profile view, okay? X-ray is comparison and also confirmed by the cephalometrics. So we normalize the position of the upper incisor, the position of the lower incisor always. And now I want to show you another patient, okay? Another patient that is uh, strictly connected with this because uh, this kind of patient, she didn't arrive in, at my, in my office. She, uh, uh, she arrived with x-rays because the mother was bringing me the x-rays of the previous treatment, telling me, doctor, I have this panoramic view, panoramic x-ray. <laughs> and I want to tell you that we are very afraid, me and my husband, for the impaction of this canine. There is an impaction of the upper canine on the right, okay? And uh, when I asked her, please bring me your daughter, finally, after one month, she came with the daughter. And this was the situation of the treatment was going, was, uh, uh, was at the that time. So you can see some broken ligatures, uh, some broken uh, lace backs, uh, a, a piece of wire going uh, gingerly, uh, pushing the canine in, in, in pre-contact with the upper lateral incisor, some debonded brackets, very, bad situation. Usually in this condition, even the patient can tell you, oh, doctor, uh, I don't like my therapy. I don't like my doctor. You never know if this is a, a kind of result coming from a, a, a kind of disaffection from the, so a kind of relationship broken between the patient and the doctor. Sometimes the patient doesn't go anymore to the controls, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't attend, uh, doesn't follow the therapy very strictly. So and this is the situation of the uh, upper canine on the right. The canine was uh, ligated, uh, only, only, only ligated with the ligature to the wire, okay? And uh, this was the situation. First of all, I told the mother, do you know what happens in a situation like this? It happens that you should know that sometimes we have an, a phenomenon that is called ankylosis. And the ankylosis uh, is uh, a kind of... Uh, 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 biological situation where the canine is completely one piece unit uh, linked with the, with the bone. So we have no chance to put out from the bone. And this can happen. And I could be failure. I can, I can fail like the previous doctor. And uh, uh, I explained this uh, and I told her this, but the mother was uh, really asking me, doctor, can we follow a new kind of pathway with you? Can, can you do, can you make a diagnosis and treatment plan for us? And at that point, I asked her, first of all, you have to close your previous therapy. Your daughter has to close your, the previous therapy. And please, if possible, come completely without brackets. So they interrupted this treatment like this. We have a dental midline discrepancy, crossbite on the lateral incisor, okay? And I asked, if possible, when you speak with your doctor, ask him, if possible, to remove all except the ligature on the canine, so we can avoid your daughter to make a new uh, surgical phase. And actually, it was very, very kind for me to remain, to leave uh, uh, this, this kind of ligature on the upper canine, so we don't need a new surgical phase. Uh, if you see, this is the infection of canine. And uh, I started with this treatment uh, and this treatment, before to start, we have to assess the diagnosis. And the diagnostic part very important, is very importantly affected by the gummy smile of this patient. The gummy smile of this patient now, we have a gummy smile, but we don't have deep bite. And we have one problem more, we will see that is no orthodontic, but it's perio problem, okay? So this is the, the, the gummy smile, this is the patient, and this is the intraoral frontal situation I was facing at that time with this kind of patient. And now Tiziana, she is 17, so completely different as age. And the problem is, the first point is the impacted canine. It's an orthodontic point. The second point, the, the first point, the orthodontic point is very important because uh, we have to remember that, and I told the mother that some of these canines especially if approached with the closer technique, 
they will express some ankylosis, okay? So we are not sure to recover this canine, but the impacted canine is a problem really affecting, really uh, imp import, important problem for the parents, but not, for the, not, not the only problem for the patient, because the patient is a really, really pays a lot of attention also at the gamis, I will tell you. So uh, uh, we, in a situation like this, we have to remember another problem is the height of the teeth. So we don't have deep bite. We have a normal overbite and we have a gamis bite. And usually the, the, the width of a central incisor should be 80% of the height. In, with Tiziana, we have the height is 104% of the width. So there is a problem. And the problem is called altered passive eruption. And this is a periodontal problem. Like my friend uh, Andrea Piloni and his group of periodontists from Sapienza University, they, they assessed that the uh, altered passive eruption is not only aesthetic problem, is a, a periodontal problem that affects dramatically a difference in gingival inflammation. So the patient with the APE, they are more, they are affected with a high, higher score of gingival inflammation. So it's also for therapeutic purpose, it's also for therapeutic reason and for predictability of the periodontal situation of this teeth, we should do something for this kind of patients. So we have our ortho problem, impacted the canine, but we have also gamisma with Tiziana. The gamisma is a perio problem. And the perio problem, it means uh, also is connected with the, another problem. So we have one ortho, one perio problem. And, uh, and third problem is the aesthetic problem because you can see here, because they are peg, okay? That lateral incisor of Tiziana is peg-shaped. And again, with the Bolton uh, uh, paper, with Bolton indications, we know that if Tiziana measures, measures from canine to canine at the lower arch, 32.5, at the upper 36.6, okay? It means we have a Bolton discrepancy, Bolton ratio anteriorly that is not 77, is 88%. The ideal weight should be 42 from K9 to K9 at the upper, but the actual weight is 36. And the amount of discrepancy here is 5.4. Is quite the, me the measure, is quite the width of a lower incisor. So it's a, a wide amount, is a big amount of discrepancy. And again, remember, we are very far from two standard deviation from two millimeters, it means we are, we over tested, we, 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 we went over the thresholds for clinical significant dental size discrepancy. And this kind of problem, the perio problem, and the uh, interarch size discrepancy problem, now we have to, we have to treat, not with ortho, but by, by means of planning, second step of treatment, third step of treatment. So going on, I started with ortho treatment and the orthodontic treatment, I started by means of uh, a full appliance. And with the, when I arrived uh, 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 to a kind of wise stainless steel wire, uh, 17 by 25, so stabilizing stainless steel, keeping the arch for, I placed the, a kind of wire that is called the overlay wire going exactly in the eyelet of the canine. And uh, I was waiting for Tiziana and she missed some appointments. And uh, with this kind of 012 super elastic night eye, copper night eye wire, after some appointments, she missed a couple of appointments, she came and the mother was bringing me a cake to make a party because she was very happy because she told me, Paolo, we have to make a party because after a long period, this canine came out. I don't know, probably I only changed the direction of the force by using also 3D to plan this. And now I can place by means of power chain the canine in this natural position. We have to open the space here. Now the overlay, we can engage fully in the bracket. And so we can correct also the rotation of the canine. 
In the meanwhile, I'm going to open the space here of the canine, pulling, pushing the, the, the lateral incisor nasally, okay? So closing the space of the lateral incisor, managing now with the full wire also in the canine in order to manage the fork. We have a red notch here, it's not inflammation, that is a maturation the tissue, okay? It's a maturation of stage of the tissue, so this is a red tissue. Going on, we can bond also the second molar to compensate the rotation of the first molar. We go on with the wire in order to correct also the rotation of the molar. And now we are ready to the bond. We debonded this, uh, these brackets and also now we moved from this clinical intraoral situation. We planned something like this to manage leveling also of the of the gingival margin. So the settling of the margin on the anterior is very important. We didn't correct completely the dental midline discrepancy because part of this correction, I left to, rest, to the restorative phase because one tooth was wider. So the center on the right, central incisor was wider than the central incisor on the left. And this is the comparison of the beginning of the treatment intra intra-treatment phase and the end of treatment. At that time, uh, I this is the final X-ray, final panoramic view, okay? And X-ray comparison, lateral head field comparison, okay? And at the end of the orthodontic stage, we corrected the impaction of the canine, but the gum is still not corrected. We cannot correct this gum is only by means of orthodontic phase. Why? Because this is a perio problem. And with the perio problem, it means the patient still feels this big problem. She didn't like to smile. And when I asked her, Tiziana, are you happy about your orthodontic treatment? She told me, yes, doctor, but I still don't like to smile. Sure, because we need the second step. We need to agree this from the beginning with our periodontist. Because this situation, it has to be assessed in, 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 the, in the classification uh, published by Coslet in 1977. We know that if the patient has a wide band of keratinized gingiva, is a type one patient. But if the patient has a narrow band of keratinized gingiva, is a, a type two patient. And according uh, 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 to the relation between the cement enamel junction, and the alveolar ridge, we, we know that the patient can be, the, can be classified as subgroup A if this distance between LAC and the marginal ridge, uh, uh, alveolar ridge is higher than one millimeter, or subgroup B if this distance is lower than one millimeter, okay? What happens if the patient is a subgroup A, so the distance is higher than one millimeter, and is type one. So we have a wide band of keratinized gingiva. It happens that we can do something very easy. We can treat the altered passive eruption by means of a very simple gingivectomy, a manual one uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the surgical technique or with laser technique, whatever we want, we, we, something easy. But if we, are, we have a patient with subgroup A, type two, we need the apical position and flap. If the patient is a subgroup B, it doesn't matter if we have wide band or narrow band, we need osteotomy because we don't need, a, uh, we don't have a correct amount of gingival to work on. So we should move gingivally the bone and then gingivally also the, the soft tissues. And this means that uh, uh, Tiziana is a patient type one and subgroup B. So very small distance from uh, cement animal junction and the alveolar ridge. So with, the, uh, with the, uh, Tiziana, we need osteotomy, not only gingivectomy. At that time, uh, uh, I didn't use digital workflow from, from the beginning, since the beginning, since the orthodontic treatment, because I was uh, introducing digital workflow exactly in that period. Now I try to start with digital 3D setup also with the fixed appliance, also with the orthodontic there. At that time, I use a digital workflow. 
sorry, uh, some word. Digital workflow only for the second step, the period step. And uh, I checked with my periodontist that the digital workflow, digital smile design was okay. So I went on with, with digital workflow, we can print the periodontal surgical template, raising mock-up, and we can also print some direct restorative guides, okay? Now, uh, we can use periodontal surgical template, and in this way, we can perform, our periodontist can perform a very easy, very reliable surgical fits. And this was the surgery of, uh, of um, Tiziana, moving the bone uh, and moving also the gingiva, okay? And now we need the restorative aesthetic phase. So two weeks post intervention, three weeks post intervention. Now the, healthy, the healing period is going very well. Even uh, Tiziana is not a champion of oral hygiene at home. But it's going well. Now we are ready to place the third part of the treatment, so the restorative one. The restorative one can benefit a lot from the digital workflow because we can use some templates. And these templates we can use to make some uh, uh, mock-up with the racing or even better composite mock-up in the mouth. And uh, uh, my specialist, uh, Ivana, has made this uh, in the mouth of the patient. The patient and the parents, they were very happy about this. So we, we, we had the chance to start in only one step after two and a half months from the debonding of the appliance and from the surgical technique. We had the, we had the chance to start with the restorative part. And after the restoration, restorative part, we had the chance to change completely, not only the orthodontic, but also the social situation of, uh, of um, Tiziana, that now she feels much more comfortable with merging, by, 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 by this treatment, merging orthoperio and aesthetics, so she feels much more comfortable smiling. And she told me now, I'm happy to smile, but I could not make this patient really happy without interdisciplinary dialysis, interdisciplinary treatment. So one step, two step, three steps treatment, okay? Now, I want to go close to the end of the presentation, showing you something that for me is very interesting in my daily practice because I started this kind of treatment with Sabrina some, some time ago, like two, a couple of years ago, uh, probably quite more. And uh, with Sabrina, she is the sister of uh, one of the doctors working with me. And Angelo told, this doctor told me, Paolo, Sabrina wants to show you something. She doesn't like to smile because she catches something like a black hole here. And the black hole is connected with the crossbite on the canine. And the crossbite of the canine is something like this, very easy to correct, okay? But Sabrina, she has a class one on the left, class one on the right, very small spaces in the upper arch. And I can tell you when I was speaking with Sabrina and I told her, Sabrina, uh, so are, we, are you willing are you going to bond, because I'm going to bond you, a full appliance, okay? And she was not very happy. She was only happy when uh, I arrived one day to her telling her, Sabrina, I was thinking about something very small and something uh, less visible. She told me, Paolo, not possible to make something invisible. And I had this kind of idea of bonding one bracket only, and uh, placing uh, uh, um, a mini screw and uh, a alpha and beta spring. This is a beta titanium 17 by 25, alpha and beta spring, pushing the canine, first of all, with the crown buckly. Why I placed the bracket horizontally? I will tell you why. <coughs> Before I moved the canine buckly, so I corrected the crossback. Then I had to, to model a, a kind of alpha and beta spring in order to derotate the crown. 
And the derotation, the moment produced for the derotation is produced by the force for the distance. The force in a system like this are applied mesially and distally to produce the rotation. And so wider, wider is the distance, higher is the moment. And the wider distance is easier to place it, to apply if we flip the bracket 90 degrees. So we don't use the bracket upright, but we use the bracket flipped 90 degrees. So the moment is more, is higher and is more efficient than the rotation. Finally, we had the rotation of the canine. And uh, now we have to, to manage something that is very, very critical when we have a crossbite on the canine or we have a, a, a palatally uh, positioned upper canine. And what is this problem to manage is the torque. So we need to manage the negative torque. If you flex, if you twist the wire before to go in the bracket, and you twist the wire, you, so you, 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 you activate in the, in the terminal part of the wire a negative torque of the root of the canine. And then you untwist, you go inside the tube and you leave it, it will work standing with staying with a force, with a torquing, uh, a couple, a torquing couple of, of forces, so torquing moment for three, four months. And the best way to don't lose reading of the torque, so to read the torque fully, is to use a tube. So the wire cannot go out. So I choose the molar tube to place on the back on the lingual surface of the canine, moving the root backly. And the, finally, this was time zero, time one, time two, time three, the end of three. You can see the position of the upper right canine now. It's very well corrected. We didn't touch anything. We didn't touch the class relationship, the molar relationship, the canine relationship on the other side. And we have a very full control of the bone level on the right side that is, uh, 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 is possible to compare with the left side is quite the same, okay? So we have also a, a confirmation of a good torque control on the canine. Now, this is the final situation, the level of the gingiva the level of the positioning of the cane and now is going to heal even more. But the class relationship, the anterior re relationship, it didn't change anything. And the, can you imagine how much is more difficult to control this kind of system with the, uh, not with the, a small bear mechanics and the only with one bracket, with one tab, with a piece of wire. So finally we had the appliance uh, that is only one tab, a piece of wire, a bracket, three things. Can you imagine how much is more complex to manage something with the full appliance? Or even if you do an invisible technique like uh, aligners, can you imagine how much more is expensive and is longer to make a treatment like this with the aligners before to correct the crossbite than to correct the position of the root? In this way, with a bracket, with one bracket, with this uh, mini screw, and with a piece of wire, you can correct uh, uh, in six months like this, uh, and with a very small amount of money, and also reducing how much to charge the patient, by reducing the time of treatment, only play only by means of the biomechanics that is all in our mind. It's not in a company that has to provide us uh, the appliance. This is Sabrina again with the control of the position of the canine and the fork. And this is Sabrina at the end. No more black holes, okay? With a very light treatment, six months of treatment. I want to show you something more, something more. Uh, with this patient, she came to me uh, to make an interview to become an assistant, a chair assistant. And she told me, doctor, I've been treated some years ago and I like this treatment. She really had a good treatment probably, but she doesn't like the position of the lateral incisor on the left at the upper, because this is an increased uh, uh, torque of the upper lateral incisor, probably not completely managed or probably some relapse from the treatment she received. And she asked me, can I do something invisible to correct this? And I proposed there to start with one bracket, now flip it 90 degrees also here, 
I will show you how, okay, and uh, a piece of wire and a mini screw here. Piece of wire 17 by 25 TMA. I go on because even here I flipped the bracket to have a, a bigger distance from the couple of force. Now the couple of force has to produce a moment that is a, a torquing moment because we have to move the root back a little. Okay, so we move the root back a little with this kind of activation, and the patient missed the, uh, so skipped one or a couple of appointments. She arrived with a hyper three hyper correction. I left the one month without clients, and then it was completely corrected. Now we can remove the minister, we can remove the bracket here, and now the patient can be very happy because with uh, five and a half months of treatment, uh, uh, despite the couple of appointments she missed, uh, uh, she skipped, uh, we have a good correction of this very small problem, but corrected with very small treatment, okay? And this is the treatment uh, progress until the end, the treatment progress uh, until the end with the parking correction. And this is uh, Antonella at the end, okay? And the last sequence uh, to show you this targeted approach is uh, dedicated to, to this lady. This lady, she's very famous in Italy because she makes some selection for uh, singers, okay, in the television. And uh, uh, she asked me, doctor, I would ask you some aesthetic situation, some aesthetic uh, solution for this tooth because I received the treatment like 25 years ago, but this lateral incisor uh, 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 rotated the game. So probably is a kind of relapse. Uh, of this uh, lateral incisor. I was really scared about the prosthetic uh, uh, option she asked me, and I would like to propose her something invisible. And uh, when I proposed the appliance, she was so scared. But when I proposed something like a mini screw, a piece of wire and the bracket, she was very happy about this. And I corrected with the rotation this. Now I'm working with the self-ligation because it's like a tube. So you can work with two hands. You don't need uh, assistant work. You don't need to go to, uh, to have some people around. It's very easy to manage. It's very fast to manage, very, very easy, okay? And uh, we corrected the, the rotation. And now we can correct extrusion and also tipping of the crown of the lateral incisor, okay? And uh, some small rotation also. You can, you can see the tipping of the correction of the tipping in the wire and also the extrusion. And now she can be ready to go to the end of treatment. Some small corrections more. With self-ligation, it's very easy to place this kind of correction. Okay? And now we are ready to the bone. And a kind of problem like this, without aligners, without a full applier, can be corrected in a adult, but also post-adolescent patient with a very easy way, with a very light way. I'm going to close and I want to give you uh, a take a message on the interdisciplinary orthodontics. Uh, it's important you discuss cases with your colleagues, with the interprofessional discussion of the cases. And remember the subjective problem list matters always, always, not only the objective problem list, but also the subjective one, because the subjective one can affect completely our treatment plan. If I was not uh, embedded, if I was not very full engaged with this, with uh, uh, Tiziana, probably I could miss a treatment of the gamma. But that was the most important part of the treatment from the patient. Remember, the digital workflow is something not completely, not fully, from my point of view, not completely explored in orthodontics. So we can use, I use this to preview to shorten and to reduce the number of sessions and shave time. But we don't have, from my point of view, we don't have to base only on this. And we have also to teach patients and to teach doctors what is possible to do with orthodontics. We can do a lot of things with orthodontics, a lot. Sometimes also our colleagues, they don't know. And also with interdisciplinary orthodontics, we can reduce the prosthetic needs. We can endorse the restorative and prosthetic rehabilitation therapy. We can cancel the, the prosthetic and implant needs sometimes. 
And uh, it's important we use, especially in adult patients, especially in pa patients with reduced periodontal support, we have to use light forces to promote bodily movement and the skeletal anchorage when needed. And try to collaborate with passion. Because if we collaborate with passion, if we share respect, challenge, and we can stimulate each other, like in my group, I have a group of doctors, more than 15 doctors working with me in my clinic, and I really have trust them. I really have a lot of interest in their therapy, in my therapy. I try, uh, despite what happened in the past, in the past, now I try anytime to hear, to follow what they suggest me and to discuss cases with them. So you can share abilities and respect. And then all the challenges, they can be lighter. I want to thank you very much for this time you devoted to this kind of webinar. I'm very happy because I was very sharp in 305. So we have 25 minutes available for the press. We have a wide session of the question available with Professor Sandler moderating. This is a very big pleasure and honor to have this. So we can go on with this. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paolo. I assume you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. Hear... Uh, thank you very much. I have a number of uh, questions that have been posed during this afternoon's lecture. Thank you for the very comprehensive um, overview of what's in fact involved in, in very careful management of these interdisciplinary cases. You mentioned at the outset the importance of measuring the teeth. Do you always carry out a formal Bolton analysis when, you, when you're assessing your cases, or is it only for the cases that you anticipate are going to be interdisciplinary. And if you do carry out a Bolton analysis, do you do this manually or is it something that you can do automatically on the study models? Oh, thank you very much, Jonathan. This is a very interesting question. And uh, I have to tell that, yes, that now I measure any patient uh, also because uh, uh, as I told you, as I told you, uh, is, um, it can be that very dangerous to the measure because some patients you can miss in some patients that they have some discrepancies. So I try to do this before I, I, I've done this um, by hands with a, a caliper, digital caliper. You have to have a high level of accuracy caliper. And now I do in all patients with the scanning technology. So I use three shape tool and the bottom discrepancy measure is a one minute measure. So it's something very, very fast, very easy. But the people, the doctors, they can measure by means of a, uh, of a paper, of a scanning, okay, printing of the scan, or also on a picture if, it's, if you have a, a, a very good angulation, 90 degrees with stativo, so stable taking of the picture, one, one, or they can do also even on a cast, or sometime even in the mouth, when the mouth is more complex, to be honest. Great. And if I could mention to all the participants, um, we still have 250 people online. If anybody has any further questions, please do feel free to post them over the next few minutes, and I will try and get through as many as I can. Um, in the paper that you cited from the Angle, um, the Angle Orthodontist by Endo et al. in 2009, they stated that anything over two millimeters discrepancy was beyond the scope of orthodontics to correct. Um, how do you feel about that two millimeter arbitrary figure? Uh, Jonathan, to be honest, we know that uh, uh, all over the world, uh, the people, they do a lot of correction like IPR, for mm. example. Yes. And uh, uh, sometimes, <coughs> sorry, we do IPR over than two millimeters, even if we don't have dental size discrepancy. So we can think that this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, threshold can be even treated uh, without uh, uh, second step or without interdisciplinary treatment. But the meaning of that paper is stay aware, be careful if your patient goes over two standard deviation or over two millimeters because this threshold is uh, clinically relevant. Yes. It means if you don't treat with uh, uh, some corrections, or if you don't treat with the two phases treatment or three phases like uh, Tiziana, you can have some unsatisfied the patients because they will finish and you have to manage some spaces where to place this. Thank you very much. 
Um, there was a question asked um, about your use of the palatal arch. And you said that using the transpalatal arch, you can just expand one side of the arch. And um, they were interested in how, how do you manage to define Newton's fundamental law of physics, that to every action there's an equal and opposite? Can I go on on the presentation again to explain this? I dare say yes, if you can, if you can access your slide yeah. um, momentarily. Yeah. Okay, so I share the screen. I had something more to show, but to be very British in my time, I placed a button to go to the end. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, this is the transpalatal arch correction. Okay, now what happens when we expand uh, the transpalatal arch? The expansion is uh, usually uh, usually is always bilateral expansion. And uh, so you cannot split because it's only one appliance on two uh, molars. So how is possible to, uh, uh, to split the force or to increase the anchorage on one side? To increase the anchorage on one side, we can add to this kind of expansion uh, a kind of activation that is a negative torque on the side we don't want to expand. Negative torque, it means extrusion on the side of the expansion. So if we want to expand the right side, like Daniela, uh, expansion is on both sides. On the right side, I, I activate extrusion, but not to activate extrusion, but because when I engage the transpalatal arch here, I can move buckly with the root buckle torque, the root. So finally, on the left side, I will have crown expansion, root expansion. It means bodily movement that requires more anchorage than the crown movement I activated on the right. So finally, I have more expansion on the right and less or zero expansion if I can increase also the anchorage by placing a continuous arch wire on the rest of the arch on the left side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And somebody else has asked, what dimension of palatal arch do you use? And okay. also, also, would you consider using a quad helix ever to produce these very same movements? Because, of course, you would have much more wire in a quad helix than a sure. simple transpalatal arch. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, uh, if I uh, want to expand only the molars, uh, and then to expand by means of the arch wire, the rest of the arch, like Daniela, I prefer to expand only by means of transpalatal arch to have something more rigid than codelix that is longer, so as a high, as a lower load deflection ratio. So in this case, I place it the transpalatal arch is 0.9. 0 0.9 millimeters and uh, uh, so 0 0.036 inches and when you double the wire like in the terminal part goes in the go, going in the, uh, in the lingual sheet uh, in that case is 0 0.942 okay it's doubled thank you very much um, and this is stainless steel it's not tra tma yeah. because yeah. also you can find some transpatal arch like tma but this is a stainless steel yeah, so it's quite rigid. Um, in, in Diana, she clearly had um, a lot of gingival show anteriorly, and she also had a degree of vertical maxillary excess. Have you got any experience of using a temporary anchorage device in the, the way in which they were described in the very first paper describing TADS, which was by Creekmore and Eglund in 1984, where they put um, a tad in between the roots of the upper central incisors to intrude against the screw. Have you any experience of that? Uh, uh, yeah, I have some experience. Uh, they have done in the last uh, three, four years. 
And uh, uh, to be honest, it's very, very um, uh, efficient to manage this with tabs. Uh, I don't like a central tab because uh, uh, quite never the patient is able to manage soft tissue. A soft tissue reactions there a lot uh, in my hands, okay, in my hands. Also because, because my patients sometimes they don't follow all the prescription of fluoroxidin with the gel, with this. Uh, I have to tell you that a very interesting option I had from the director of the Maryland University during AAO uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, because he showed, Bram, uh, um, he, showed, he showed us how to do this uh, covered by flap. So undergoing uh, uh, on a flap. So you can do a flap, a flap uh, uh, surgical access, and after you can cover. Uh, in my hands, the best way to do this is to place two miniscules, not one. I manage more easily for the upper and especially for the lower. Uh, now I'm trying to, for, uh, to, 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 to test a protocol together with doctors working with me with, for a guided orthodontic movement. So with a template, a printed 3D template, in order to guide the movement of the intrusion until the end, until the targeted uh, uh, move, uh, did the targeted position printed on the project is 3D project. And this absolutely is very well managed with tabs. Thank you very much. Um, Simona, one of our participants has asked which arch wire size and which material do you use for the truer arch? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, this is an interesting question because I didn't touch this point. Uh, uh, I, the trua ideally is made by TMA. Now, if you use, uh, like I used uh, in the, during my period of my career, during the period of my career, I was using uh, Ricketts prescription is 18 by 25, 18 by 30. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, you can use uh, 16 by 22 TMA or even 17 by 25. Um, the best now, if you use uh, 22 by 28, so the typical straight wire uh, prescription is to use at least 17 by 25, ideally even 18 by 25 TMA. But TRUA is described made in TMA because uh, you need a kind of low, def low deflection ratio and also range of activation very wide like TMA can express and stainless steel cannot express because you have a plastic deformation and night eye cannot express because it's not bendable in that way. Thank you very much. Um, Peter has oh. asked a question um, about the case ah. Daniela and he was interested in Daniela's case. How many months of class two elastics were you required to use? What force of elastics do you use? And for what duration during the day do you ask your patients to wear them? Oh, thank you, Jonathan, for this question. Is uh, uh, class two elastics usually, if I have to apply from the lower molar to the canine, lower first molar to the canine, I try to use in normal divergent patient or hypodivergent patient, I try to use four and a half ounces, one for one, uh, sorry, 316. If I move from the second molar, I can use one, the same loading, but with one fourth, so wider elastic. Uh, in this patient, the elastics uh, were used uh, for five months and uh, uh, on the right side full time, so day and night, on the left side only during the night. I have to tell you honestly that Daniela was a perfect patient, okay? Now, most of my patients, they don't want to wear so long the elastic and not for so long time. So in these cases, usually I use no compliance system. But if you have a, a perfect patient like Daniela, she likes everywhere. She uh, is very, very um, available to follow your prescription. The best is to use this kind of prescription. One of our participants, Michael, has asked a question saying, when you use temporary anchorage devices with the beta titanium wire, just to bring the canine over the bite and into a better occlusion, do you have to adjust the wire or bend the wire at each visit, or do you make a new sectional arch wire? Thank you. Very good question. I 
it depends because for example the, for the first case i use i, I showed you during my uh, present during the part of presentation of the targeted approach with tets i i um, moved buckley the canine with only that wire and uh, you can then rotate with that wire and you can twist with that one but in the last patient the adult one uh, i had to change because uh, if you move the tooth and after you need a longer wire and you don't have some some loops available to a length wire you should place you should place a new piece of wire it's a a, a, um, a beta titanium new piece of wire and it takes no more than 10 minutes to model to be honest uh, in my in this patient i'm testing this kind of approach that i like a lot because they love is a uh, very 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 uh, is not expensive, so it's very light. So in this patient, usually if I have six appointments, if I manage six appointments, only uh, a couple of times, only two times, I have to change the wire, no more. Another question about interdisciplinary cases. Can you always determine from the outset when prosthetics will be required? Or do you do you do a setup for many many cases, and do you tell all of your patients that perhaps at the end of treatment we may require some prosthetics to get as good a result as possible? Uh, Jonathan, please can you repeat? Can you repeat because I lost something. Sorry, sorry. How do you determine from the outset whether you will need to have prosthetic buildup of the teeth? So uh, do you mean uh, how can I uh, make a prediction of the end? Yeah, can, can you always determine? Do you always know um, with confidence? Uh, w uh, yeah, thank you for this question. This is uh, a kind of analytic evaluation. And, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, um, interdisciplinary orthodontics, uh, everything should be analytic, also on the 0 0.3 millimeters. Uh, from my experience, uh, the most uh, reliable analysis uh, is to, to do this uh, on the cast and then to transfer in the mouth and then to agree with the prosthetic, uh, prosthetist and then to provide the treatment. But the, and you can do the same also with digital workflow. The, the, the critical point is how to transfer in your final positioning uh, uh, part of the treatment, final positioning of the teeth, the final position of the teeth agreed with the color. And this part, in my experience, can be, I don't know how much is reliable, but can be increased as reliability if uh, you use a kind of template. So now, a kind of template can be the aligner. A kind of template can be a guidance. I didn't have time to show, but in this patient, when I started, I want probably I can go back and show in this. In this patient, when I start, before before to start, I try to share again the, again the screen. Before I, I started, I took an impression and we made a vacuum molded uh, appliance to make the final mock-up before the restoration. And also I removed the, the, the raisin and I had the final position of the teeth. And on this one, you can also uh, print or you can also ask lab to make you a template. It's a template of the final positioning of the teeth. Also, if you use a, a standard edgewise technique or standard bracket technique, uh, it's not a template of the torque or the correction, but if all the teeth are going inside this, uh, this uh, uh, impression you can be you can be not sure but you can stay more relaxed about the final result you agreed you, with your prosthetics okay. perfect um another question yeah. how do you differentiate between altered passive eruption and some sim simple gingivitis because at the end of our patient's treatment when they've had full fixed appliances there's often some hyperplasia of the gums and how long do you leave it after treatment before you would consider referring on to a periodontist? Oh, very good question. First of all, uh, uh, when we debond uh, the, the appliance, fixed appliance, 
usually in my experience, we should wait something like two, a couple of months at least um, to have a good healing of the gingiva. But it depends from the whole origin of the patient. If you have a perfect patient, uh, it, it, you can wait like a couple of months. If your patient uh, is not very good with the oral hygiene uh, at home, probably you never arrive at the point to assess this. Mm. And in that case, you can ask the help of periodontist or by yourself, like you do at the beginning, is by probing that you can differentiate uh, 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 altered passive eruption from uh, a gingivitis or periodontal problem, okay, uh, periodontal disease. So uh, if uh, any kind of uh, uh, evaluation brings you, uh, leads you to uh, evaluation that the patient, to final consideration that the patient has a, a, a altered passive eruption, then you wait at the end the assessment, the, uh, sorry, the settling and the final uh, healing of the gingiva, like a couple of months, then you can start with orthoperio, or the perio metric uh, analytic evaluation. And there was another comment asking, are you able to offer any explanation how the periodontists use these templates to actually plan the surgery? From my point of view, mm. uh, the periodontist is the actor of this. Yes. So um, the, the amount of uh, reduction of the bony gingiva is uh, uh, functional, is based on a functional evaluation because if you do more, too much, you have food impaction in the patient, horizontal food impaction. Even if you have a closer the contact points, if the, if the, uh, the, the, the uh, shifting of the gingiva bone produces too much a space in the embryo, too much black triangles, you can have a horizontal food infection. So you have to evaluate this from aesthetic point of view, you can settle and you can manage with the digital workflow, for example, it's very useful. But finally, is your period is with, with your periodontist that you have to manage the amount of reduction. In that case, if you design even with the hands, then you can print a, a, a printed um, a template. And this is very, very smart because even a periodont the periodontist doesn't have to think too much about what to do this, how to do this. It's very, very well guided, the surgery. Thank you, Paolo. Well, it leaves, we've now come to the end of our time for the questions, I'm afraid. And it leaves me to thank you once again for a really comprehensive view of the management of what can be very, very challenging cases to all of us. And it gives me great pleasure to hand back to Laurent to close the session. Thank you so thank much, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, to start with, uh, thank you. I want to say thank you to Alex for the technical support in Spay. Thank you so much, Alex. And you cannot imagine, it was a great honor for me to have two good friends of mine um, uh, with me today for this webinar. So, Paolo, thank you for the very high level presentation. Thank you so much. And Jonathan, you cannot imagine my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Hey, my pleasure, Laurent. You a lot. Always. I miss our motorbike uh, trip, as you know. <laughs> so, have a, have a nice weekend. It's going to be sunny all over Europe. I can see behind you, Jonathan, it's very sunny in the UK. It's beautiful already. Look. Yeah. Fabulous. Wow. Jonathan, you have to invite us. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you Paolo, can all come, come. <laughs> Paolo, thank you so much. Uh, you, have, you made a 60-minute presentation with 25 minutes of questions meant for you in Napoli doing so precise. Thank you. <laughs> I spoke with Jonathan about this, and we settled it very, very sharply, very, very well. Jonathan, so I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, to manage, uh, uh, to, to, for the management of the, of the webinar. Everything was perfect. Thank you also to the to the technician. And I want really to thank because it was big pleasure and honor to have Jonathan uh, 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 moderating this session. Thank you for the time you devote to this. And uh, thank you to our participants. I hope to see you in person very soon. Fantastic. Both to do this. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.